What's up, everyone? Welcome to a very special Union Bros Talking Soccer podcast. As always, I'm Dave Knittle, but I am joined with the two Christians this week, my brother Christian Knittle and uh, our favorite recurring guest, Christian Sandler. Christian Knittle, say hello. I think our last name is pronounced Knittle. At least that's the last time I heard <laughs> what it was. Um, I'm, I'm doing all right, Dave. Trying to power through this week, not going great, but we're, uh, we're making moves. Okay, that's good. Glad you're powering through it. Yeah, on the the most recent podcast, I think I mispronounced our last name uh, again. So I don't know if you happen to to catch that as well. But uh, one of these days, I'll get it right. Christian Sandler, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well, Dave. Happy to be on as as usual. And um, I, for one, am. All right, Christian Knittel, quick question for you. Yeah, Did, I didn't hear a single word. He just okay. said it completely yeah, cut yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, the internet uh, didn't, uh, I don't think, caught anything of what you just said, Christian Sandler. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, let's... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close some things here. I don't know if that'll matter. Okay. Yeah. I heard I'm doing well, Dave. Thanks for having, and then that was about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was the only important thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so anyone watching on YouTube will cut this out of the podcast, but I got on my, my brand new Sons of Ben scarf from my Scarf of the Month Club. Rocking that. Ooh, oh, yeah. Four Leaf Clover. That. Oh, I should wear my thing. Nice. Uh, yeah, ready to talk union here, so I am I am pumped. Uh, okay. Christian Sandler, let me know when you're uh, – you're good, or you think uh, we can try it again? Uh, okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna try not to move, and maybe that'll help. <laughs> okay, just stay perfectly still. Yeah, I'm just not moving again. <laughs> All right, uh, Christian Sandler, how are you doing today? I I am doing well, Dave. Um, happy to be on as usual, and I'm. Very glad the union season is over, as I'm sure many other supporters are. So glad to be talking about that whole. I mean, I'm problem. I'm not really glad that the season's over. I wish it was still going. <laughs> I wish they were good enough to have it still been going. You know, I don't know if this iteration of the team uh, we wanted to keep watch playing, but uh, so we're going to dissect all that. But uh, real quick, so. Christian Sandler, I wanted to give you a quick plug. So you've been writing on Philly Soccer Page, which is one of the you know awesome blogs out there covering Philly soccer. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to just mention uh, Philly Soccer Page and where people can maybe find you on Twitter and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a super, super cool site. We cover like all levels of soccer, Union Steel, um, down to you know more local stuff, uh, phillysoccerpage.com. You can you can find me on Twitter. Just uh, just search my name, look for a handsome fellow, and you know I post all all my stories there. And uh, you know I'm, I've been doing lately. We're doing some sort of union recap stuff. So I think next week I'll have something out on on Rosenberry, oh, nice. um, and sort of what to watch with him in the off season. Um, and yeah, everyone can go on and read my my piece. Uh, on Bedoya right now that you guys provided some some great perspective for. Yeah, and we'll talk about that a little bit on, on today's podcast, and we'll link to Christian's profile. I think your Twitter handle is at by Christian Sand, right, Christian? Is that correct, yes, yeah. by Christian Sand. Yeah. So we'll link to that on here. So before uh, Can we get... I ask a question before you keep going? Yeah, so you yeah. cover all levels. I think you should start covering our league that I'm in. And no, I, listen, I, I put in a, re- <laughs> I put in a request um, to cover <laughs> the uh, colonial... It's, uh... Is the yeah. USL of PA. Right. Well, listen, according to some of your, your teammates, you guys could beat the national team. That's what, so that's, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. I, that's the word on the street. I'm going to need to invest <laughs> to get that permit. But uh, certainly some yeah. high-level soccer going on over there. <laughs> Definitely. So before we, before we get into our topics real quick, so we have a union-specific trivia question this week, and uh, I actually have it. So our trivia question this week is in the relatively short history of the Philadelphia Union. Do you know which season the Union scored the most regular season goals and how many goals that was? So we will think on that 
the Christians will think on it, listeners, you will think on it, and uh, give your guesses at the end, and I will reveal the answer. So with that, let's get into our first topic here. And what we wanted to cover in the in the first topic on the first segment is just kind of big picture, just how the season went. So, you know, Christian Knittel, the team finished with same point total, better goal difference than last year. But, you know, by all kind of fan metrics, it seemed like a down year. You know, what were your take on the on the season? What was your take on the season? Uh, my take on the season this year was that the East was far superior than it's been for probably the entire history of the Union. The, the East was by far the better division this year, and it was very, very competitive at the top end. I didn't think other than D.C. United, any of the teams were really that poor in the East this year. So it was a, it was a real challenge. I think the Union were pretty poor. Well, they... <laughs> They weren't great, yeah. I'd say that. But I still think that the East was much better, and it was tough to get into those spots, even though you get to the same points level, goal differential's better. It's just higher competition, and it's going to be tougher to get into those playoff spots. And starting the year with, what, one win in the first like, 10 or 11 games, something like that, I don't know exactly what it was. Yeah, it was no wins you're in the first gonna, eight. Yeah, you're not going to catch up. You're just way too far behind at that point, and it was a killer. Absolutely. Christian Sandler, what was your take on the Union season? Yeah, very similar. I, I touched on that eight-game winless streak uh, in, my, in my article. And, um, I mean, it, it, it's over at that point. Like, it, I think best-case scenario was to sneak into the playoffs after that debacle. That's when we started messing around with Bedoya. That's when we started panicking and tactically changing things. Uh, but I do think the, the East definitely has a lot to do with it because I, I think it would take a rare scenario to have a better goal differential and, and not make the playoffs the next season. Like, that doesn't happen very often. So I think MLS is unique in that aspect. Like, uh, from year to year, it seems like teams are either very good or very bad, and it goes from conference to conference. Um, so the problems are internal, and I think a, a lot of them have to do with with the union. Um, but, but the Eastern conference is certainly a, a fair shout. Yeah. And I, and I think the union, I think struggled from just inconsistency. So I think they had talented players and they put together runs, whether it was in matches, they put together good runs and then they just had lapses. I think they were one of the worst teams after the 75th minute or something like that, if I remember. And then they had a couple stretches where they just performed terribly beginning of the year. And then towards the end of the year, they, they struggled. Um, but in between, uh, that's what makes the team so frustrating because they can play decent soccer. It's just just the lack of consistency that that was most frustrating. Also, the thing that I just wanted to point out, like the the attendance figures, it just seems like like it's just wearing on on the team. I think or on the fans, I should say, it seems like or, well, it was definite the lowest uh, average attendance throughout the year. This was in the union's existence was this past year, and you know I I just worry and I'm fearful that like fans are just starting to slip away. So uh, I'm, I'm nervous about all that. And like, you can see it definitely in the sons of Ben, it always looked half empty, especially towards the back half of the year. And so that's, that's definitely a, a indicative sign of poor sentiment among the fans. So I definitely need to get things turned around now. I think the problem with that is, and I know you disagree with me on this front, but we need a world star to come into this team to attract people to come watch. That is what we're missing. And a, a lot of teams around the league have that, and we need it. Fernando Torres and Mascherano both want to come over here. Those are huge names. Yeah. I would much rather get an Miguel Amaron, Joseph Martinez type of South American who could have the potential to go on to become a world star. I want to get somebody at the beginning of the career to – that is motivated, that can go on, we can sell him at a profit and use that to reinvest and re reinvigorate this this fan base. Because the fan base is smart. Like, I think, yes, it could attract kind of the non-stereotypical soccer fan, so just the not very knowledgeable person who just sees this name and, and comes in. But if the union sign legit potential star players that are up and coming, I think it'll reinvigorate a lot of the very knowledgeable Philadelphia soccer fans in the area. So I think that's what they need to go after and follow that Atlanta model. Yeah, I just wanted but, to add, I think um, I think a lot of those intelligent fans are in the Suns event, and that's that's really where I look uh, as, as sort of a worry, worrisome point, is like if the Suns event isn't filled, you know, that that's one of the most passionate 
uh, fan bases in, in all of MLS. I mean, it's nationally known, very famous. Every time every time ESPN broadcasts a game in Philly, Taylor Twelman is, is going on about the Sons of Ben. And you know, if if that's not if that's not filled up, then we can't expect the rest of the the stadium to be filled up. Um, you know what that takes. I, I'm not sure, but it's it's not Bedoya, as we'll go on to discuss. It's it's got to be something bigger. Fernando Torres is a big name, but he's he's aging. You know, so we're gonna we're it, it needs to be something. Um, but if the, if the Sons of Ben aren't filled up, that's that's a big problem. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the offseason moves that that were made or, or that actually weren't made. So let's start with Jim Curtin as union manager. So Ernie had a press conference, sporting director Ernie Stewart had a press conference and said that Jim Curtin it will be staying on as manager. Christian Sandler, you know, what do you think about Curtin remaining with the club after, you know, the seasons he's had? Yeah, so I think there, I think there are two sides to this. Uh, the first is that it's it's on the players. Like, it, we, we can't blame Curtin here. He's, he's messed around with tactics. Some things have worked well. Some things haven't. But at the end of the day, the, the players aren't good enough. Um, and I think we, especially over in England, I think you see a lot of coaches getting sacked prematurely because people aren't aware of that. That it, it, it's a lot to do with the players. Um, we need to we need to give Curtin a little bit more time to get some players in that fit the system, and progress from there. The other side is he's had enough time. I mean, I don't know exactly how long he's been here, but it's been it's been a decent while, and. I think you could argue after a season like this, it, it would make sense to, to kind of hit the refresh button um, as far as staff go. I don't know. I'm torn in between those two points. Uh, either way, I think if, if we get a, a new crop of players in there and it doesn't work out very soon, it's inevitable that, that Curtin will be gone. He, I, I think he's on, on his last chance coming up here. Christian Knittle, what do you think about Curtin remaining with the club? Is he going into his fourth year? Yes. Okay. So I want to say he think, took over in the summer of 2013 interim. That's what I thought as well. Uh, I just, I really have never had a problem with Curtin. I actually like him as a manager. I think he's very calm and collected. Even though his interviews, he kind of sounds frazzled and says um and uh a lot. <laughs> he He is very, very composed. Mm-hmm. He seems like a guy that does know the game and, Although he might not be a big world name, he's still young and he's still building his career. And I think he could be a long-serving manager for the union. And just to go back to Christian's point, I think that we need to build that supporting cast of players around them. I don't think we have enough experienced players. I know you want to go after these young guys who are going to build and then leave. I don't want that. I want experienced players who have been there, done it, and are able to share with the young players we already have. But we have that in Bedoya. We have that in Medunyanin. Like we already have those players, so I don't think we yeah. need to build off of that. I just don't think Bedoya is that. Right. I, he's right. not. We're gonna get to that later. And, Med- right. and Medunyanin, we're gonna get I to that. Later. With. All right, but, but so as sticking on the curtain theme before we before we transition to to some of the other things. So I completely agree with both of you guys. I am very much in the team curtain camp. Just the only thing that I have struggled with and that has started to wear on my patience with him as a manager is just the lack of flexibility in what he does both in game as well as from game to game. He sticks with the four, two, three, one formation and there isn't, you know, he makes a lot of the exact same subs. He's bringing on two wingers and a striker pretty much every game. There isn't a ton of adjustments that seem to be made and that's just the thing that I have just grown more and more frustrated with Curtin about. I love everything about the way he he handles dealing with the media. He seems like a great guy. I like him. I like that he's young and can still develop. It's just I'm not sure how much he's actually developing. And a lot of that could be on the players. Like I, I totally agree. He the roster is not talented enough to compete with anyone at the top of the Eastern Conference. But good managers make worse players better, right? Or, or they just make players better. And so that's the thing that I just struggle with. I am willing to give him one more season, but I just need to see some improvement on that front for me to get comfortable with, with him taking this club. So what do you think it needs to be? What are you considering successful for him in his fourth year? So number one, qualifying for the playoffs. And number two, just seeing those actual in-game adjustments, not just rolling out the same formation when we haven't won a match in eight 
in eight games, still rolling out kind of the same players, kind of the same formation. Yes, he changed some of the players towards the end of that winless run, but it was still the same formation. For me, it's much more the tactics that are being deployed and the way that the the club is playing and the formation. And I know that they have preached just they're dogmatic about they're playing this, they're going to go the IX way and like this is our formation, this is the way we're going to play, it doesn't matter who we're playing against. And to a certain extent there's you know nobility in in doing things that way, but when it's not working, I, I just need to see something different, you know? Yeah, and I think that what you said about substitutions is something that has bothered me with him. He does make the same substitutions almost every game, but the craziest thing to me is like I feel like he always does it at the same exact times in the game too. He never changes tactics a little bit earlier. Like maybe make a sub at halftime if things aren't going well. Exactly. Exactly. Christian Sandler, anything else to add on this point? Yeah, no, I, I'm on board here. I, I, you know, I was talking about some changes. Those were mostly, you know, within that same formation. Like we, you're right in that we have not seen very many different structured formations from Curtin at all. Um, granted, I think some of that has to do with the players like Sapong, you know, he is what he is up there. He, he works well in that, in that spot. Oh, uh, I love Sapong. no, I love Sapong yeah, well, what too. Are you, what I'm are you saying, saying here? <laughs> I'm saying he, he, he works very well as a lone striker, I think. Yeah. Meaning like you could be hesitant to, to put someone next to him. He, I mean, listen, he's That's the true. best player That's on the true. team this year. Yep. But I'm just saying that, you know, like we could, we could have seen some different formations uh even in game we see managers change formations in in the match all the time uh nothing of the sort from Curtin. so that that's one issue certainly yeah so let's go up one level and start talking about ernie so ernie stewart former u.s national team legend um and he had come over in 2015 he took over uh in december of 2015 took over gm responsibilities for the union or technical director whatever you want to call it he basically took over soccer operations running the philadelphia union and you know in his two years christian Kindle, what has been your assessment of ernie's performance as as gm i thought we brought in some decent players i still think we need a star as i said earlier but I think that he is bringing in a lot of kind of average to maybe slightly above average younger players and bringing players like Modunyanin is a huge statement. I think he was there, right? He, he brought him in. Yeah, he correct? brought him in, yeah. but who yeah, are yeah. the youth players that he's really brought in? Well, I mean, did Derek Jones come through him or was he here already? I mean, he was already like in players the academy. Like I mean, he signed him, but he was already in the academy. Yeah. Well, he's another one who I don't know where he went. He kind of fell off and didn't appear again for the union. To the second half of the season after yeah. he went to the U20 World Cup. Uh, well, he got a concussion and then apparently wasn't right the rest of the year. Oh, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For those um, who, do, who don't know, Christian had a little incident with a deer while driving and is still recuperating from that this weekend. Yeah, yeah not great. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I think players like Epps and I can't remember who's the other winger who played I, I, uh, the one with the hands with an A. What's his name? I can't think of his name. I yeah, he's like players like that who have kind of just disappeared. Yeah. But I think that they are somewhat talented and they could be making a difference. But they're playing for the steel right now, and I think we need to get some of them playing for the union, similar to the way I think the U.S. is struggling. They're not bringing in those young players now. They're waiting till too late. Yeah, Ayuk's in Sweden, actually. He was on loan, but that's that's a good point. I mean, you know, we, we have the steel, and you're not seeing a ton of players. And, and Ernie's MO when he was overseas was he worked at these smaller budget clubs. He developed youth academies, and he sold them on for, for large profits. And so we haven't exactly seen that. And granted, it's been two years, and so someone at his level needs more time before, you know, we can really reap the rewards of it, but you know, it's definitely been mixed results. It hasn't been a smashing success so far. Christian Sandler, what were your thoughts or what are your thoughts on Ernie's performance so far? Yeah, I think especially in the executive position, I don't think two years is enough time to evaluate really. Um, I think the, the general fan will just look at like big names, like what big names have you brought in? Like Madunian in as good as he is, like as, as good as he is to, like a soccer player, like a fan that also plays soccer and knows tactics and stuff. He's just like most, most union fans probably can't even pronounce his name. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, it's not the type of player um, that they're looking for, but him even more so than Curtin, I think deserves a lot more time um, given his track record. 
Yeah, and and I think so. I'm I'm still happy with what Ernie's done. Um, he's definitely had some big misses. Alberg, from my opinion, was a big miss. I think when Alden was a was a low risk, uh, you know, high reward potential, and he didn't work out. But um, you know, I think the jury's still out. He's definitely he definitely isn't a smashing success. But I think that there's still time for him to. I'm willing to give him another couple years uh, to get his you know plan and philosophy out he there has and in place. Quality soccer in his blood. Yes, so you would hope true. that that would shine through eventually, and it will. Uh, with Harris, like he said, that uh, it's not a big name that the casual fan is going to want, but he does have Messi's jersey from the World Cup. So maybe if we get him this summer, he's out of contract. So that would be nice. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Keep your hopes high. Uh, let's go up one more level and talk about kind of the the big guy who drives uh, a lot of union fans absolutely insane, and that is uh, majority shareholder of the union, Jay Sugarman. Christian Sandler, you know, what are your thoughts on 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 Jay Sugarman's ownership of the union? You know, uh, do you know much about him? Do you, you know, I know he doesn't come from much of a soccer background, and so he's not too much in the media and isn't on the forefront of a lot of what the union are doing. But I know a lot of fans are frustrated with him. So, what are your takes on on Jay Sugarman and his ownership? Yeah, so I, I really don't know too much about him. I understand the the criticism from that perspective if he if he's not from a soccer background. Uh, what I do know is that to bring in big players, you have to spend money. It's, it's pretty simple. It's a, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, if he's not willing to do it, that's fine. But he's got to be content with the with the results here. I mean, this isn't this isn't going to change uh, based on based on the players we're bringing in. So either he has to uh, you know talk to talk to Ernie and and really come to terms with the fact that hey, we've got we've got to spend more than we're spending, or we've got to work around these. These numbers here, or or it's time, or it's time to move on. I'm not really sure how that would work logistically, but um, so do you give him any sort of pass or credit for the fact that the union literally started from nothing? They had no okay. team, they had no infrastructure beforehand, and so only within the last year or two have they built a practice facility. Have they built a like a training center where the with a locker room and where players can act? Do you give him any pass for? you know, having to spend on all that stuff before we invest in the roster or no? No, absolutely. That's all very important. That, that all of that stuff matters, but it's, it's all behind the scenes. You know, you're not going to be judged on that. Like you, you are not the average fan for even knowing that. Like it's, it's, it's going to be about the big names and on the field production, unfortunately, whether that's fair or not. Um, but no, there's no question that stuff is important and it's, it's helped the club grow. All right, Christian Knittle, thoughts on Sugarman? I just, I'm not his biggest fan. I don't know much about him, but I know he took this club from nothing, and like you just said, and built it up. But I think the biggest mistake he made was putting this freaking stadium in Chester. I think it was a huge mistake. And but that, that stadium. That wasn't know, all but, on him. I know it's not all on him, but that had that just killed everything. I think if that was there where all the other stadiums are, it would make such a difference. Absolutely. Now, in fairness, the economy literally collapsed right after they announced that. And there were big grand plans to develop that entire area the way that a lot of other stadiums have have gone in in places and, and developed areas is just part of their ownership group. I think it's called the pollen group or these real estate investors that were supposed to help develop that entire area around the stadium. And when the real estate market collapsed in 2008, when they were building the stadium, basically all that they built was the stadium. So, but your point is is 100% on point. If this was down in South Philly with all the rest of the stadiums, th- this team would be a smashing success. I agree, and they would get fans. I, that would sell out, I think, every single game if that was in South Philly because it would just draw the fans in. That is a hugely populated area. Yeah, I, I realize uh, I've said smashing success about six times on this podcast. Well, so it looks I'm like we got to, a podcast name. Yeah, I'm gonna try to <laughs> I'm gonna try to limit that the rest of the way. Um, but my other point with him is, if you're not going to invest heavily in star players, you have to invest heavily in your facilities and your youth program. It has to be focused on that. And I don't think there's been enough investment overall. Yes, they built this practice facility, but I don't think that's state of the art. We need to have the top of the line. I don't know why your face is like that. I don't think it is. I was there. I've seen it. It's not. It's whatever. But I, I just. Inside. 
Maybe I was. You don't know that. I do know that. <laughs> it looks pretty state of the art. So I don't know. That's just a bold say. And and the things you're talking about are investments that pay off over like a five to ten. I'm aware of that. Fifteen year horizon. I'm aware, so. but I, I think it needed to be done at the start. If yeah. we were going to do this, because it, right now yeah. we are now seven years behind where we started, yep. and it looks like nothing has changed. Absolutely. And Atlanta came in guns blazing with. $65 million practice facility pretty much from day one. So, um, you know, I know we can't all be Atlanta, but you're, you're incredibly right that the union are seven to 10 years behind, you know, a lot of other clubs in the league. All right, let's keep this thing moving. Cause I know we're running a little long and that was just our first segment and we have a lot we want to get to. So we're going to go to some music for listeners on the podcast. You're going to hear that. And then we'll be right back with our second segment. We'll talk more on the uh, players and roster modes. So stick with us. That was almost 30 minutes. Yeah, that, that was a long time, but that's all right. We'll try to keep this moving the rest of the way. You guys still good? Yep. Cool. Welcome back, everyone, to our second segment. We're going to start talking about rosters, and let's start with Alejandro Bedoya. So we alluded to this earlier in the podcast. Christian Sandler wrote an article about Bedoya's season, so definitely go check that out on Philly Soccer page. We will link to it in our podcast show notes. But Christian Sandler, you're kind of the expert here. What was your take on Bedoya's season for the year? <laughs> this is very kind, Dave, far from the expert. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think Christian will agree with me in that we start from the beginning. I've never really thought Bedoya was all that good. I mean, never. Like we're going back five years, national team. I've never been a fan of Bedoya, uh, and I think I think even you touched on this uh, in the article, Dave. I think a lot of people's expectations were were far too high. I, I 100% agree with your assessment of a fringe national player. I don't. Playing, but how I was talking in terms of ability, like that's what he is. He's a fringe guy. I really don't think he was ever going to be this this star player. Um, you know, like my my uncle, born and bred in Philly. We were talking about this a few weeks back. He's like, Bedoya, you know, star national team player, two goals. He's got to score more goals than that. That's not what he does, you know. And yeah. whether or not that's Fair or not, I mean that's just not what he does. He's a holding midfielder, um, and I think I, I think a lot of that is unfair on him that people expect him to do things that he's he's not capable or has never done before. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, position or not, attacking mid, holding mid, wherever it is, he's not he's not a game changing player. I think you said that yourself, Dave. He's just that's just not what he is. He's not going to be a high caliber guy. Um, he's very yeah. solid. But, but that's all. That's all he is. Yeah, exactly. And that's and the quote that I gave you for the article is that he's a glue guy who is perfect as maybe a third-level DP on an MLS roster or even really a Tam, gay, Tam guy in, <laughs> in MLS's roster. Uh, Tam guy. I want to make that clear. Tam guy. Uh, in in today's MLS, like that's that's what type of player he is. He's a TAM player who is should be making five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars and be supplemented with three designated players who are difference makers. And as good as he is, I personally view him as incredibly talented. It's just the way that the league works and the way salaries work and and roster mechanisms and structures is just he can't be your number one designated player that you need to rely on to carry your team. And I, I and again, I'm a big Bedoya fan, and I think he is very, very talented. It was just an unfair position to put him in. Christian Knittel, what was your take on Bedoya's season? Let me take a breath. Okay. <sighs> this guy... <laughs> She has no business being our DP. I, I just, I don't understand. I, I, he can't even make a penalty. Like, it drives me crazy. He, he yeah. does not. No, 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 no. Penalties are, <laughs> yeah, lots of people can't make penalties. Penalties are not a way to judge a player, but continue. If he's the star of the show, he better be able to make the penalty. If he's taking them. Moe Du yeah. missed tons of penalties for us. Mo, Moe Du was able to do things on the pitch. <laughs> I just think so that. So is Bedoya. Nah, nah, no, he can't. All right. <laughs> uh, so as a holding mid, you got to expect him to play defensively as well. I don't think he provides anything defensively. He's not a strong tackler. He barely intercepts the ball, I feel like. And yeah, he might be a metronome, but he's not a good one. He's very offbeat if he's a metronome. And I just think that, he, yes, you were saying that he only scored two goals, 
yeah, I don't expect him to score goals, but if he's going to be the star of the show, he better be scoring goals. I don't care. Like, you can't just do like, – he, I don't think he's providing anything. I don't really remember many assists he's had this year either. Because he's not – he's a metronome in the sense of – not he, he's not a metronome in the sense of Vince Nogueira was a metronome for the union who always was on the ball and who was taking it off the center backs right next to them and kind of connecting it to the next guy in the midfield. He's a guy kind of in between the lines who's playing from defense into attack. And so he's getting, you know, whether it's he's making the pass that leads to the pass that leads to the goal or something like that a lot of times. And he's doing a lot of unheralded work. So to look at just the stats, I think is unfair to to him. Okay, but did, are you saying that gameplay-wise, you would not take Mo from three years ago and put him there instead of Bedoya? Because I think that it's hands down Mo would be better yeah, suited to play in that position. Mo is a freak physical athlete who was an incredibly talented soccer player. So yes, in their prime, Mo Mo Idu was better than Alejandro Bedoya. Mo was arguably dominant and and a starter on the U.S. national team when he was at 100. percent I was always a huge fan of Mo, and sucks that injuries robbed him of his career so yeah no i would take mo over him but then you saw bedoya out to the wing or you just have a midfield of mo bedoya and madunian in which is what was supposed to happen and that is a legit playoff caliber mls midfield at that point yeah but i i, I agree with that midfield that would be fine but i just don't think that's creative enough i think madunian is very much a metronome for the team and bedoya i don't think plays enough penetrating passes and doesn't provide enough goal threat when you move him up into that position. And in, you said, put him on the wing. He provides absolutely nothing on the wing. I know we have them there for the U S and it's just a, it's atrocious to watch. It's painful. All right. Great to disagree. Christian Sandler, anything else you want to add on Bedoya before we start talking about Rosenberry? Uh, you know, as you guys are fighting over this, I'm just thinking like, I wonder, I wonder how someone like in a different country views Bedoya, like, like totally like far from American, like some other league, some other country. Cause I think yeah, it's about France. perspective. Yeah, fine. Like, what if what if he's like Venezuelan and he's not on the national team and he's just he's just what he is now? We'd we'd probably be praising him for being a solid role player. It's it's unfair to him to put him on this stage, uh, and, and that's coming from a guy that doesn't think he's very good. So yeah, I think we just need to keep that. In he's mind. he's coming into a role that Nugera and Mo Idu were playing. You he Big has to live to up to that, but he has Big to live to up to that. If you're going to be paying that money and expecting that quality from a U.S. and international, he has to live up to that. Yeah, but they had Maidana in the center attacking role and Barnetta. Like, what what was wrong with the union this year was Roland Albert came into camp incredibly out of shape and just wasn't the player that they needed at the number 10. So it's unfair to compare him to Mo and Vince when they had that player who could kind of carry the team offensively. And Bedoya didn't have anybody that he could rely on, and so he needed to carry the team and was asked too much. I think El Senior was very good at playing in that central role. He he developed into that, but he's played on the wing his entire career. It was the first time he'd ever played as a center attacking midfielder. And yes, he did well, but there were plenty of instances where he didn't make the right pass and he didn't play well. El Senior, I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah he had his moments, but um, again, I don't think he was the type of cam that Barnetta or that Maidana was. So, all right, let's, let's keep this thing moving. We're going to, isn't going to be a long one people. So I uh, hope you like it. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Keegan Rosenberry. And so for those who don't know, Keegan Rosenberry was runner up rookie of the year last year, played every minute in the regular season for the Philadelphia union, got a U.S. national team call up to camp cupcake in January. <laughs> But then start off the year in uh, in bad shape. Uh, the, you know the union were not doing well, and I think a lot of it had to do with Josh Yarrow being injured, and he had played next to Yarrow at Georgetown, and then with the union, and all of a sudden was playing with Gucci Anyewu, who was a little bit less mobile uh, than uh, Yarrow, generally speaking, and uh, Curtin yanked Rosenberry, and then didn't play him for something like 15 to 20 matches after that. Christian, what was your take on this whole Rosenberry situation? Uh, you know, what was your take both from Rosenberry's perspective, from Curtin's perspective, as a fan perspective? What's up? Christian uh, Knittel. Yeah, sorry. We got two Christians here. I forgot. <laughs> uh, I like Keegan Rosenberry. He was very good, but similar to how you see every single sport these days, the second season slump, that is what we saw this year. I think Sophomore he'll be good. Slump. Eh, whatever. We can call it whatever you want. We can, yeah, we can call it the second season slump if you want. <laughs> yeah, why not? Coming up with your it's a new names. thing. It's a new yeah. thing. Yeah. All right. So I think that he is a solid player. He will be fine after this year. I think a lot of players, when they start making a few mistakes early in the year, 
they get in their own heads. It affects their confidence. They expect the same levels of themselves from the first year when they're running on a lot of adrenaline almost that they're living up to the hype. And it's really tough to live up to those expectations. I think the expectations are going to lower and he'll, he'll thrive in that environment. The positive thing is that Ray Gaddis is a very solid player. I really like him as a right back too. Yeah, he doesn't provide a lot attacking-mindedly, but defensively he's very solid and he can recover very quickly. Yeah, yeah, he's got the physical tools, but and Ray's great in one-on-one defending, but positionally I think he, he's not always mentally there. And like he's a great kind of backup right back in MLS. So I think Ray is incredibly serviceable, but for me, so but what was your take as far as Curtin's so you said you came at it from Rosenberry's perspective, but what about Curtin? The fact that he just kind of let Rosenberry sort of wallow for 15, 20 matches. I think that he had no choice in that time. I, I don't know if the amount of time, if it's 15 to 20 matches, that is a little excessive, but I don't really remember it being that long. I know I went to most of the home games. I only missed two the whole season and I, Keegan played in a bunch. Oh, yeah, I'm a big deal. No big deal. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so he, he did play semi-frequently. Yeah. Ray started most of the games that I was at, but Keegan is a solid player. And I don't think that he was purposely left off for no reason. I think he was kept out of the squad because he was lo- low on confidence. And towards the end of the season, he got more time because I think he built up that chemistry again with his partners at the back. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Christian Sandler, I know you have an article coming out soon about, about Rosenberry. What, what was your take on this whole situation? Oh, yeah. Well, I only missed one home match. This <laughs> I wish that. you weren't a liar. Uh, <laughs> no, I only went like two matches. Gonna get. Uh, so the thing about this whole Rosenberry thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into this more deeply next week. Um, it, I, like, I, I was wondering if there was something that went on like behind the scenes that we didn't know about, like something totally unrelated to soccer that happened to pull Rosenberry like that. And whatever the reason, it, that affects a player uh, almost always negatively. Um, uh, you know, I think it was towards the end of the season, he, he tweeted a very controversial picture. He I think it was like a picture of it a band. It wasn't even controversial. Yeah, it wasn't even controversial, but they made it a big deal. But well, continue, that, yeah. That happened. So, yeah, something about, like, you know, looking to get off the bench and whatever it was. But yeah, it was him and Marquez sitting – for those who don't know, it was, like, him and Marquez sitting on the bench and with, like, a thinking face, like, uh, I need a caption or something like that. Yeah, help caption it. Yeah. Um, so I think people took it as like, well, I'm pissed off that I'm not playing more, da, 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 whatever. It, it was fun good. out of proportion. Yeah, I want that sure. for my players, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think the question now is, you know, how does he come back from this? If, 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 uh, if indeed he's going to stay with the union. Um, but it's very odd that an MLS all-star player like that just doesn't play for half the season. Unrelated to injury, as far as we know, it, it's just, it was a very odd situation. And, um, I, like I said, at first I wondered what was going on. Yeah, and piggybacking off of that, because it doesn't add up, because Curtin is a manager, and he's proven to be a manager that plays players no matter how bad they're slumping. We all remember Andrew Wenger, right? Oh. And and he started every match. Same thing with Chris Pontius this year. Chris Pontius didn't score his first goal until August or something like that, played every single match. And I that swear if you mention Ken Dribbit right now, I'm going to punch you in the face yeah. from here. <laughs> I think Ken Trivet got a got a raw oh, deal. I think no, he was a talented no, no, player no, no, uh, no, no, that no, no, was thrust no, into a bad no, situation. No. And if Ken Trivet played the entire season with the steal last year, I think he would be in a much better position and would be contributing at the union level right now. Let's leave that to one side because this Hell isn't a Ken no. Trivet situation. <laughs> I think I think Christian Sandler, you're spot on. Something must have happened because it doesn't make sense that Rosenberry just wasn't playing when Curtin has proven to play players through the slump. And so Again, it gets for as consistent as Curtin is with his lineups and his formation and things like that. This just seemed really inconsistent with everything else that was going on. So I don't know. There, it just doesn't add up to me. So I'm I'm interested. I'll be I'll be sure to read your article when you when you finish things up next week and uh, be curious to see if there's anything else you're able to sort of identify because it doesn't make sense to me. I think the biggest problem for Keegan, and I think you hit it on the head, Dave, was Josh Yarrow being out. I think the chemistry that they've built over the last, what, six years together was immeasurable. And losing Yarrow was a killer because of his physical tools that he brings to the the union, as well as his defensive and 
just reading of the game with Keegan. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's spot on too. You know, like I said, Gooch is much less mobile than mm-hmm. uh, than Yarrow. And so maybe, you know, I think I had read stuff that Rosenberry didn't know exactly how to push forward or how much to, to hold back. And he kept getting caught in these in-between zones, but let's keep this thing moving. And uh, since we touched on Gooch, let's talk about some of the players that were, that were cut or just weren't picked up or, or whatnot. And that are going to be leaving the union. So anyone in particular, you know, Christian Sandler that you're sad to see let go. Was there any surprises about it? Or is this just pretty much what you expected from the players, you know, not coming back? Yeah, I, I certainly wasn't really surprised. Um, for many of the names. Uh, I mean, Pontius, it's just a shame that like, it turned out the way it did. You know, I, I think, again, he was put into sort of a, too big of a stage after last year. Uh, that, you know, the whole story is when is Pontius going to score? I mean, it, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. And in fairness to him, he, he did switch positions. So Fafa Pico took his left wing spot, which is where he was most comfortable. And so he was learning a new position to a certain extent. But continue. Yeah, that matters. It totally yeah. matters. Um, again, I think you know we can we can go on, and I'll let you guys do this. We can go on about who left. I think I think it's so much more important on the other end. Who are we going to bring in to to replace these guys or or fill in these roles? Um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff on on Philly soccer page about the the departures. If if the uh, listeners want to get more into that, but it's going forward now. It's going to be it's going to be about the other end. I think. Absolutely. So yeah, I don't want to harp too much on it either. I mean, the only two surprises for me were Fabinho, uh, well, three, I guess, Fabinho and uh, Herbers were the two big ones. So I think Fabinho is on a relatively small contract and it seems like they want to bring him back um, because I think he'd be a fine backup left back. I think they need a, they need a starter and Herbers who was injured most of the year. And so it seems like they're trying to bring him back and it's more a contract situation. So when I first saw the list, I was kind of really surprised at him. Uh, but then after reading and hearing Ernie, it uh, seems like they're trying to bring him back. And then I was slightly surprised at Gooch just because he was on such a minimum deal and he was relatively low risk. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm not too shocked at, at really anyone that's been cut. Christian Knittel, anyone surprised for you? Was Mo released? Yes. Okay, I thought so. Uh, and El Sino? Yes. Jesus. Okay, so we're clearing out everybody from the team. Yep. I see that. Okay. Uh, the, so, another one who they may be looking to bring back on a much yeah, lower wage, I think which I'd be, be okay with. I think it would be a mistake to let him leave. I think he's provided enough. Yeah, he was not fit for a while, but I think he, he has worked on that, and he was providing the offensive At 550, spark. His salary was $550,000. I think he's worth that right now. I, I don't El think he's... Yeah. In today's MLS, I do not think so. Okay. Well, like a, I think he's worth it. I think he provides player, maybe, but... most of the spark to our attacks. And he... Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, but if you build a supporting cast around him, I think it's fine. I think he would I be think really I think he needs useful. to be a supporting player. I think he needs to be a supporting player. Hey, you know, oh, actually, I, I don't... With that, but... He's very, he's very one-dimensional, and um, I think he's talented. I just think that he's talented as a sort of bench, sort of not, not even bench because he wasn't good off the bench, but just as a depth player. Sorry, so do you continue. think he would be a winger in a good system, or do you think he should be in that 10 role? Because I don't think he's fit enough to and going to go up and down the wing like he used to be able to before he came to the Union. Yeah, I don't know I mean, if he'll be able to provide that. Yeah, it all depends on the style they want to play. If they need wingers that track back, then yeah, he doesn't he doesn't fit that very well. Yeah. Uh I just think losing Mo is gonna hurt, but he hasn't played for two years, so whatever. I just yeah. always have been waiting for him to come back into that midfield. I know. And me too. Now it's not gonna happen. But Fabian mm-hmm. Herbers is the one that you mentioned that surprised me the most. I could would be shocked if we didn't re sign him. Yeah. Because I thought me he too. was a pretty decent player. He's not a world beater, but whatever. And another shout out. I don't know if we are going to talk. Are you going to talk about Jack Elliott at all? No, no. So, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out that he, he finished third in the rookies uh, voting this year. And I thought he was very, very solid. I didn't expect much from him. He's a fourth round pick. He didn't even think that he got uh, picked. I don't know if you guys read that story. No. Oh yeah. He, he got a call from his dad saying, Oh, so you're going to Philadelphia. And he's like, what? I turned it off. I thought I didn't get selected. Oh, that's yeah, cool. So, yeah. I, I, for a fourth round pick, he was solid all season long. And I really like him as a player. For a fourth round pick, he was incredible. There are yeah. first round picks that, that sometimes don't, you know, uh, get any minutes. And so for him to be a fourth round pick, yeah, 
That is what what makes me incredibly nervous or scared is that the union's track record of second year players is not great. So well, we have a uh, lot of depth. I feel like at center back right now. Yeah, so yeah, trust is okay. coming up. And, yeah, but yeah, I just want him to continue to progress because he was so talented this year. So let's let's get this thing. I would say at center back. That, sorry, I'm just gonna keep. That's uh, nice. This is my last point. Uh, yeah. I think that Jack Elliott is kind of a, a player, and I feel like this is the case with most center backs, other than Yarrow, who had, had injury issues. I think center back is a position that you just get better with experience. I don't think you really get those slumps. Not that I could think of from a lot of players. Okay, fair enough. Any any other players, Chris and Sandler, you want to talk about, or any any other thing you want to cram into this this second segment before we go on? No, no, I'm almost there. Christian Knittel? Nope. All right, let's keep this thing moving. So we're going to go to one more musical break. And when we come back, it'll be our third and final segment. Stay with us. All right. <laughs> I guess we didn't even really talk about Andre. Um, no, well, we, we did not. It. Well, we'll talk about it. So we're talking about this offseason in the future in this last segment. So um, we'll bring up Is Andre. Is that all we're talking about? How, how many different topics are here? So there's like four. So I want to talk about YSC. So my, my thought where it was YSC, um, who do the union kind of need to sign, and then what would be successful offseason, and then what are your expectations for next year? Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Welcome back, everyone, to our third and final segment. And, you know, we've been a lot of looking back at this point. Let's let's turn our focus and start to shift to the offseason and into the future. So first thing I wanted to talk about was YSC Academy. So for those who don't know, that's the Union Youth Academy. It is a high school and um, where the players go full time and they they work around their soccer schedule. So Christian Knittel, you know, what are your thoughts on on YSC? What do you expect from them? You know, this year and then kind of into the future. YSC, I don't think it's going to provide anything in the upcoming years. I think we're still a couple of years off from actually producing a lot of talented players. I expect some news that, okay, there's some star players at 14, 15 years old who are starting to show what they can do. They're not going to get into the limelight. And I think there's a whole other conversation that we've discussed multiple times, but until we stop sending players to college, it's never going to improve because they have to be playing during those years at this level. But I think that these 14 and 15 year olds need to start to probably what play in the U 18s, the way they do it in Europe, where you're four years younger and you're playing at a higher level, playing against players older than you, bigger, stronger, and you have to show your technical ability. Yeah. I I believe they did that. I just don't really follow what's happening at the Academy levels because it's not big news over here. Philly soccer page covers it pretty well. I read an article earlier today from uh, Tim Jones does a really good job uh, of that uh, from the Philly soccer page. So I just want to give him a shout out. I always appreciate reading his stuff on the steel and uh, youth Academy. What's up, Timmy? All right, so, um, <laughs> so I, uh, I just I think that we're going to be waiting a couple of years before we see a lot of these youth players coming through, and I don't know if there's really anything short-term that we can expect to see from them. Okay. I do like that with the integration with the steel, like a lot of those academy kids at 16 years old are already getting sort of first team minutes with the steel. So that, that's been exciting to kind of watch and yeah. follow. Christian Sandler, thoughts on YSC? What are your expectations with, from it? I'm not uh, with any particulars. I know I know the general concept behind it, and you know if it's similar to models in Europe that we have seen work very well, then I'm all for it. I mean that's what we need to do. We talk about this at World Cup time, like a country like Iceland. I mean that that's that's what that is. That's that's rebuilding their soccer program in like a matter of ten years through through these types of uh, academies, and and there's no reason we can't do it. Um, but I, I also agree with Christian that it's, it's going to be a while. I mean, we can't just expect this to work overnight. Even, even 10 years is considered a very quick turnaround. Um, but yeah, you got to start from the bottom. And I think this is what's going to be happening across the country, really, after, after this World Cup debacle now. We, we need a total revamp of the entire system. And again, we, we need to go look at the, at the blueprint that all these other European countries have, have made. 
Absolutely. I think YSC is a great start, but I think what needs to happen is just wider, like YSC needs to be the pinnacle of like a broader sort of pyramid just with youth development in the union structure. And, you know, I know when the academy first started, it was kind of that way where there was like a club and country, they called it sort of call up where you had all these cl all these clubs that had players and then the union would call them up. Um, you know, if they had some sort of, I think there's only one team at each age group, and I don't really know exactly how it's done overseas, um, but with how many people are just in the Philadelphia metro area and within their catchment, I mean, just, just have one team for the academy at each sort of age group, it just seems like too little. So, you know, as YSC grows, I think another important thing that I would like to see is just like Again, just a, a wider net, and uh, I'm sure they're doing things like that. But um, you know, I, I'm excited for what the future holds because I think it will be better, and it needs to be better. I think too many of our best athletes aren't going to soccer because they're slipping through the cracks, which is kind of what you're saying. And they're they're not getting picked up by these academies at a certain age. And although a lot of our best athletes are going to other sports because that's where the money is and that's where the fame is, I think that we have to make more of a conscious effort. And in the Philly area. There are so many good soccer programs that one team is not enough. You have to be putting together a lot of players and training them all together. Agreed. I don't agree with the athlete argument. There are tons of, I, I think you, I, it, arguably soccer has the best athletes because you need to be exceptionally well-rounded as an athlete to play the game of soccer. And so I don't necessarily agree with the best, best athletes are going to other sports. And I also don't, uh, or I, but I do agree with the fact that, I mean, straight monetary incentive is obviously much higher in, in those other sports. And so MLS needs, I've, I keep harping on this, MLS needs to raise the salary floor and needs to raise the cap to improve the bottom and middle of rosters. Because if I'm going to sign an MLS pro deal and I am, Zach Pfeffer, take him as an example, 15, he signed a contract <laughs> with MLS. I think it was sixty to $70,000 if I remember correctly. I mean, yes, that's great for a 15-year-old, um, but that's, you know, if it's $100,000 or $200,000, that's a completely different world, right? And so at that point, you're not worrying about really any finances or anything like that. And you can really do your best to focus solely on soccer, focus on nutrition, focus on taking care of your body because you have disposable income. When you're an MLS roster, I think the supplemental roster, so the last roster in MLS right now is right around 50 52 or $55,000 a year. Yes, it's a great income, but still at the end of the day as a professional athlete, like it's not a ton of money to invest in eating the best, in going to, you know, getting massages or yoga or whatever you need to do to take care of your body. You can't go above and beyond. And so um, that's where I think the the future you know, is for MLS. And so I have, we've gone off on a different tangent. Uh, so I'm going to circle this, circle this back around. Let, let's, let's get back to the union here. Christian, please stop rubbing the microphone across your face. Let's talk about the union here. And uh, so th this off season, what do the union need Christian Sandler from a player perspective? Uh, good players. <laughs> and so I think a lot of, yeah, that's a good, good sports people. Um, I've heard a lot about like, oh, we got to keep Andre Blake. The, the union do not need to keep Andre Blake. That that's absurd. Honestly, I think it would behoove them to to sell Andre Blake, uh, especially from what we've seen with McCarthy. Is, is McCarthy not a viable MLS goalkeeper? I think he is, hundred yep. percent. I would. I, I would get on board with you here. I, I would dish Blake as great as he is. Uh, sell high right now. Sell why he's one of the best keepers in the league because he is. Send him to Europe. A lot of teams want him. That's great. We need to we need to take those play at this point in the union's uh, whatever you want to call it, time frame, whatever. That's that's it's about investing. It's not about keeping Andre Blake and you know paying him paying him a bunch of money and, and fiddling out other play. Like Blake <laughs> send him to Liverpool. That's you know what Liverpool has? <laughs> <laughs> Liverpool has money that the union can use. Yeah. So let's. So I'm not. I don't mean to single out Andre Blake here. He's been amazing to watch. Um, but I think that's part of the mindset here. Like you have to. I, I can't tell you how much money Fulham has gotten from selling academy players. And to, who and to who do they reinvest that in, or what what position should they reinvest that Blake money uh, in? So man, there's. There, I mean, there's there's too many. I think center back is very strong. 
Um, I would I would look for number ten first and foremost. I think uh, I, I think Elsino has been good, but but number ten number ten's got to be that that difference maker that we've been talking about. Um, with Pontius gone, someone out wide as well, um, and someone in the holding spot. I mean Bedoya, as we talked about, I don't think he's the answer as well. So really. I would start with the midfield, revamp the entire midfield. Sapong was stellar this year. Uh, if we can hang on to him, he's he was one of the best strikers in the league this year. So I would start with the midfield. And frankly, if Blake if Blake is leaving, I would reassure all Union supporters that that is a very good thing. It, it needs to happen eventually. Yeah, I'm I'm 100 on board with with that thought process. Christian Canito, what about you? Thoughts on on what exactly the Union need? 1,000% on board with the Blake idea. I think it's time for him to go. I love him as a keeper. He is a game changer at when he needs to be. But we have McCarthy, who I really am high on. I think he's a very solid goalkeeper, and he's MLS quality already. I think that at the back line, we're all right. I think a left back probably needs to come in to replace Fabinho. Even if we re-sign him, I think we need a stellar left back who can go back and forth. I think Fabinho is more solid going forward. We need a little bit more of a defensive shield on the left side. I think that a holding mid is key this summer. I, we need someone who's going to lock down. I don't know if Derek Jones is ready for that. I know he's a solid player, but we need someone who's going to win the tackle, put their body on the line to keep the ball out of the net, can block passing lanes, and I don't think we have that in anybody right now. With them? And then, All right, continue. And... A number 10, I'm not so sure that we need. I think Bedoya and El Cino could fit in there. I, I'm not big on them, but I don't think that is the key point that we need. I think we are missing Barnetta, but Who was I, I think if we – what? Who was a number 10? But that's a, that's a, that's a level of player that we're, we're not going to get, and I understand that already. I don't I think we – almost. I, we have cleared off so much salary from the books, and there are rumors that an additional $2 million in TAM, so targeted allocation money, is coming in to MLS rosters. So I think we're going to have plenty of money to to go out and sign players like Bar, Barnetta. Um, and then just, just regarding your defensive holding midfielder, I just I, there's no, I don't see any way they sign one. They brought back Warren Carval. They have Derek Jones. They view Bedoya in that role. Madunian, you can kind of play there. They have Najem, who is kind of a uh, number 10, but is really more of a number 8. And you know, apparently Fontana, the the youth player who is signing a first-team contract in January, is also kind of in that role. So I just don't see any way that they sign that type of player. Can I finish a story? Yeah, go ahead. You never let me finish a goddamn story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you were done. I think that we need a... Uh... Somebody to compliment Fafa out wide. I think he's going to be our left winger. We need someone kind of similar to him on the right side, preferably a left-footed winger. I think that is a key point. And moving to more of a 4-3-3 formation where we have one holder and two just all-action midfielders would be key. I think that Barcelona formation, I know that's kind of – it doesn't matter. Well, Don't even, Messi, pretend I didn't say you – know, Yeah, when we well, I mean, he'll be finished. He'll fit right in go. out there on the right there you go. It'll be amazing. <laughs> But I think that we need to bring in somebody quick and dynamic that can play out there, that's going to take people on. And yeah, Ilsenio, maybe he goes out there again if we resign him. I don't know. I don't want him to. I understand you're shaking your head. I also don't want that. But I, I think that we need a clever, quick, turn of pace kind of someone who can push the back line back, open up space in the midfield for our midfield to keep the ball, keep it moving and create for Sapong. Yeah, because Fafa really wasn't a great creator. Uh, he, and he also was not the best finisher. So, yes, he, he's incredibly quick and got a ton of goals and was great in the air. So a player like him, but maybe a better finisher. And, uh, I, I, yeah, I agree. So I agree with you guys. Um, I agree with you guys at least uh, a little bit more Christian Sandler. So um, left back, uh, Cam, and... Uh, and right wing, I think, is definitely areas that we need to upgrade. So don't want to harp too much on that. What would be uh, – so I guess that kind of alludes to uh, what would be a successful offseason. So is it just signing those players? Is it – you know? so combine that with what are your expectations and hopes for next year? So Christian Knittel, what what's a successful offseason, and then what do you expect from the team next year? 
I think we need to sign a star player. I've said it a hundred times today. I don't care. I think what position? That. I and mean, if Messi's out on the right wing, we're going to be. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that we need a winger. I think that's what we need. I think we need a okay. star player. Star uh, even yeah, I, I, even if. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I love him. Love him with the golden locks. If we were to bring in someone like Fernando Torres, yeah, he's not a winger, but CJ can play on the wing. It doesn't. I know it's unrealistic and it's impossible. No, but I don't even rate him that highly. You That's, are ridiculous. If you no, think he man. came over here and he would not bang in goals, that you're crazy. He's doing it for Atletico still. No, no, that's ridiculous. I know you never rated him highly, but he no, scored 81 but, goals in 142 games for Liverpool, so yeah. that's ridiculous. And he should have had more. That team put him in incredible position. We, we can go back and forth about Torres because we're both Liverpool fans and we feel differently, <laughs> but uh, I was happy that they sold him. Anyway. Yeah, and even, at the, even if they weren't to get a player like that, I, I still would prefer a right winger. If you bring in someone like Mascherano, honestly, he will lock down that midfield. Are you kidding me? He would. He is that player who makes those tackles out of nowhere. Yeah, but I just think it shows a lack of ambition from the team no, it to does sign not. a 35-year-old who's at the end of his career. I don't want those types of players. And then what? You're going to have Jarek Jones. Uh, yeah, he can learn from him, but then he's going to spend another year not playing. Like, I am all for why Matt not? Toronto won't be able to play every single game anyway. He's going to. Yeah. They're going to rotate. It's fine. He, yeah, I, you need that leadership to teach those players how to play the game and where to be and give them that experience that they don't have right now. Okay. And so my expectations for next year <laughs> <laughs> are that I think as of right now, it's really hard to tell without the signings, but it, we need to make two or three key signings in the areas that we discussed. And uh, if we do, Maybe fourth in the East, hopefully. I think that we're too far behind right now, and we're not going to catch up to Toronto, NYC, teams like that. And it's unfortunate, but I think we can catch the Red Bulls. I think teams like that are not that far ahead of us. Montreal, but who cares about them? They're irrelevant. Um, <laughs> Remy Gart is their new manager. Fun fact. I did. I did. I see that. Yeah, he was the former Aston Villa coach. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that... That's a statement of intent. <laughs> I like that. I like that signing for Montreal, but I still think that we're, we have quality in our team. Not enough right now, but if we get the supporting pieces to go with the quality that we currently have, we easily can be a mid-level playoff team. And if you get hot at the right time, you never know what can happen. And I think that we need to go back to Jim's first two years where we were making the finals of the Open Cup, maybe take that competition a little more seriously. I think we've always taken it seriously. God, those finals. Oh, my God. They're so painful. No, 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 no. no. We're not going to talk about them. All right. Uh, Christian Sandler, sorry. Uh, what, what's a successful off season? And uh, I know it's early, so do you have any expectations for next year, or is it still kind of too early? No, not yet. I'll, I'll, I'll tack on that at the end here. Um, successful off season, j just fill the gaps, man. Just try something new. Sorry, Christian. Mascherano is not the answer. Fernando Torres is not the answer. It's counterintuitive. It's counterproductive. Like, if you're going to get rid of – Aging players, you got to bring in some youth. You got to think about the future here. Torres makes us better. There's no question about that. Mascherano makes us better. But that's money that could be spent in youth development and, and younger talent. We could spread things out a little bit. That's what yeah, I think. Yeah, but if you want to get the fans on board now, you need to make moves for now. That's, that's the fan base is dying. That's, the fan okay, base that's, is dying. That's fair. Yeah, the fan base is a big part of it. I, I, you know, we, that's, we could go on about that. Torres would fill some seats, but at the end of the day, if, if the union are winning, I think the, the seats fill themselves. Um, I, I are you saying put in youth that's going to take years out? Like, we need the fans now so I'm that we don't lose them. I'm not necessarily talking about like teenage youth. Like Just bring in someone that isn't at the tail end of their career. They can be a proven international player, but make it someone that, we, that, that the fans can see for three to five years rather than one to two. That, that's all I'm saying. I don't have any names in mind. I don't think, um, you know, a, a big player certainly helps. Uh, it's just, it's just got to be something new, something fresh. It can't be same old curtain stuff here. And as far as expectation stuff, I mean, like, it, it just has to be some kind of improvement. I think that goes without saying as far as the playoffs go. Like, it, it's got to be a playoff appearance. If they miss the playoffs again, curtain's gone. Yep. Um, 
but I don't think there's a spot. I don't think fourth, fifth in the East. It, it just it just needs to be this time next year. We're talking about what an improvement it, it was this season. It doesn't matter what exactly it is. I think that means the playoffs. Does that mean another Cup final? I, I don't know exactly what that entails. It just it has to be improvement from here, um, not just in goal differentials or numbers. Like it, it's substantial improvement in in any way. Agreed. Agreed. And so, I, I mean, I fall kind of into the same camp as Christian Knittel. I think that this this roster is talented, even with the players that they still have. I think they have a strong core, and I think I'm excited with how much salary has come off the books. I'm slightly hesitant or, ner- or nervous because I think it's underrated how long it takes for rosters to truly gel. And so, yes, we have a lot of consistency, but we're going to need to assign at least two to three key players that are going to make a difference next year, and getting them integrated is always slightly a challenge. But I think that there's no reason if they go into this offseason with how much salary they have and they sign some players that we all hope and expect that they can't compete for mid-level in the Eastern Conference. So, you know, I'm, I'm on board with, with that thought process as well. So with that, guys, Christian Knittel, anything else you wanted to mention or talk about? Uh, I do not believe so. I just think that we need to just, just bolster the squad. I don't think that much has to t- change tactically. Maybe we do go with two strikers next year. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we bring someone in who's good. I, I don't know. It's tough to say now, but as things stand, I don't think we're too far off from being where we need to be. We just need to make the right moves and a couple of them. Agreed. And I, the one thing I wanted to tack on before is just that I am all for, I, I would much rather see us start to give youth a, a chance and at least have a hope for the future. Maybe that results in a couple losses, but at least we can see progress in that sense where maybe Trusty gets a game. Maybe Jones gets a run of 10 games where he's starting. You know, maybe some of these youth players get more minutes because that's what they've been preaching and we really haven't seen too much of that so i would like to see that as well i heard, I heard Polisic wants to come back to pa that's yeah, i just definitely. heard that rumor somewhere yeah, i heard that too <laughs> christian taylor what about you anything else you wanted to mention or talk about um not related to the union if everyone could just say a quick prayer for fulham we're, we're reeling right now our manager is <laughs> under fire we can't get a win we're losing at home to bottom feeders it's really a mess over there we have like the best roster in the league but our top score is out. Nothing's going right. Just just keep us in your thoughts uh, because it does you, not uh, look like we'll be in the Premier League. Next yeah, year. you mentioned them earlier, and I was not happy about it because I don't want to be where you guys are right now. <laughs> it could be worse. Uh, it, it could be Sunderland. It, it could be Sunderland who is uh, falling at a much higher rate than anyone in England <laughs> right now. Sunderland is in the <laughs> Very true. All right, let's get to our trivia question. Uh, so for those who, who may not remember, because it's been a little while, uh, trivia question at the beginning of the podcast was, which season did the Union score their most regular season goals, and how many goals was it? Christian Knittel, your guess? I want to say it was 2013. And how and many goals? And I would... I just can't remember the year of that. I remember they won six to two in Montreal. That's, that's just the game that I'm thinking of. And that was 2011. I can't remember. I was in Barcelona. That was 2011. And I remember. Yeah, mm. I remember. Right. I was I'm gonna go 2011. A, uh, youth hostel go 2011. <laughs> using the shared internet computer checking that score. Uh, you're going 2011. Mm-hmm. How many goals? I remember. I remember watching it at Kevin Matthews' house, and his dad kept turning it off because he's like, "This is shit soccer." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But uh, number of goals: in 34 games. No, no, no. 61. Not a number. Okay, 61. Christian Sandler, what about you? What year and how many goals? Uh, I'm going to guess not this season, and I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a number, man. 56. Okay. I got enough. And what season? Pick a season. Uh, you got seven choices. Season. Okay. Uh, uh, your, your first uh, point of view. 2013. Okay. So for uh so both incorrect. So it was 52 goals, which is kind of pretty pretty low. It's for, pretty low. Yeah. yeah. Uh for an all-time record and it was in 2016. So it was actually last season. So there you have it everyone. Thanks for joining us this week Christians. Thank you guys for being here. Go check out Christian's uh, articles on Philly Soccer Page, Christian Sandler's articles on Philly Soccer Page. Follow him on Twitter at by Christian Sand. You can follow Christian Knittel on Twitter as well, Christian, you know, with your... I'm very active on Twitter. Yes, you guys should active. check me out. Knittel12, <laughs> I think. What is yours? 
Probably. I don't know. Yeah, you don't even know. All right. Mine's <laughs> is at Deacon. It's 11. Uh, but if you want to follow our uh, podcast Twitter handle, it's at BT Soccer Pod. If you want to get in contact with us, our emails, our email, not our emails, our email is bros.talking.soccer at gmail.com. And uh, guys, thanks for being here. Listeners, thank you, Al, for sticking with us through all this. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. See you, Can you please not give out our uh, personal emails? That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right, good work, guys. Uh, I'll I'll edit it down. It'll be up later tonight. Uh, it'll be a bit long, but whatever. It was fun. I I think we're all pretty knowledgeable about this, so this was this was a lot of fun talking. Yeah. Definitely. Did you guys know that I went to all but two games this year? <laughs> I don't think we had heard that. Wait point. a second. What happened with the deer? Did you hit a deer? Oh yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> I got into a car oh, accident no. on Sunday night. It was really bad. Wait, with, but just with the deer? Or, or I, have, I have, yeah, no, just with the deer. I was on the highway though, in the middle lane, and I, there were two cars on either side of me. I don't know how I avoided that. Wait, but... what? I didn't know that. You were in the Wait middle. Yeah. And the deer ran in between our two cars. Like it was in front of the car in the left lane. Like did a quick turn and came in between and hit my mirror. Oh, and the move. mirror flew. Yeah, I was like, why couldn't you just fuck that car up? You fucking son of a oh, bitch. Wow. <laughs> All right, people on YouTube, I'm on the, on the broadcast. Uh, thanks they for watching. So See ya. Yeah, but I have. Not-